Hello, and welcome to episode 124 of the Casual Try Hard Podcast. I'm Brian. And I'm James. And we are two hours into podcasting with the longest pre-show in history in the books. You're welcome, patrons. You are welcome. So what we want to do today is look at where modern sits now mm-hmm. before modern horizons too, to kind of give you a sense of like where we are, what the format looks like. And so, you know, kind of where the cards are going to slot in and where, and what kind of card is going to end up needing to, uh, going to end up being good in the format going. Yeah. Forward. We've talked before about like pillars of formats and how to approach a format based on the pillars. And that's kind of what we're going to identify now is the pillars of the format. That way, when you're either looking to enter the format, you can pick one of these pillars that kind of suits your play style. Or when you're brewing with new Modern Horizons cards, you can kind of formulate a game plan against the different pillars of the format. Yeah. So if you want to tweet at us about Modern in general, you can get us at Casual Tripod. Yep, or you can hit us up on Facebook at Casual Tryhard MTG. You can drop us an email, show at casualtryhardmtg.com. If you're looking to pre order anything from Modern Horizons 2, uh, spoiler alert, don't wait until the set comes out because pre order prices are super high right now. Please use your TCG player affiliate link, tcg.casualtryhardmtg.com. Uh, anything you purchase after following that link, we'll get a percentage of that helps keep the show going, pays our bills. Also, we alluded earlier that our patrons get a super bonus this week because our pre shows like two hours long of us going over Modern Horizons 2 stuff. So patrons, make sure you check that out. And if you want to check it out, come on in and be a patron. Even a, you know, whatever you can contribute, we're very grateful for. So come on over and join. As we mentioned, patrons get access to our pre-show where we just kind of catch up with each other for normally about 45 minutes. Today it was two hours. While we check our mics and make sure everything's working correctly. Patrons also get access to our show notes. I usually post them the day before the show goes live. So you get a sneak peek of what's coming up in the show. And we got some other stuff coming up that I think I'm going to roll out to patrons first. So stay tuned for that. And maybe... I think I got another month or so, and then the next round of patron uh, givebacks will be coming out. So if you want to jump in before then, hop over to patreon.com slash casualtryhardmtg and listen to our giant (laughs) pre-show. Giant Uh, pre-show. Yeah, giant pre-show. We also have a YouTube channel, Casual Tryhard MTG on YouTube. We should be doing, or I should be doing, a pre-release kit a set booster box and a collector booster box uh, box opening for modern horizons too. So stay tuned for that. Um, We've been trying to roll out some more content for uh, the YouTube channel. Uh, Brian's been posting up a whole bunch of draft videos from Strixhaven. Those have slowed a little bit, but one day they'll come back. Well, we got, we got something else in the pipeline to maybe fill that void for another couple weeks or so until uh, forgotten realms comes out. So if we can find some time to get together and record something, stay tuned for something new also. Yes, we're trying. And yep. And then we have our discord. Um, there's a link in the description for our discord. There's a link on all our social media. Come on in, talk to us. It's probably the best quickest way to get a hold of either one of us is on discord. That's the only place where I get alerts on my phone for the show. So if you want to get at me, uh, do it on discord. And next week, I believe, is going to be our Modern Horizons episode, right? It should be, yeah. So if there's anything in particular that you guys want to hear about uh, from Modern Horizons 2, hop into our Discord and uh, post up in there what you want us to talk about, uh, whether it's specific cards or an archetype or a keyword or a mechanic or, you know, whatever. Whatever you want to hear about, Post this, post it up in there, and I'll make sure it gets into the show notes so we talk about it. Yep. All right. So, like we said, we wanted to go through and kind of check in and see what's going on in modern right now. So, what mm-hmm. was your methodology for picking these decks? Because let's be real, he Carson did all the hard work. I was incredibly scientific in building this list. I went to Goldfish and MTG Dapate. And I picked all of the decks that were 2% or more of the meta, and I made a list. 
There you go. So, <laughs> um, one thing I will say about the modern meta game is just looking through Goldfish. This is kind of how you expect the modern meta game to look, mm-hmm. in that there's like, you know, a handful of de- there's one deck that's eight and a half percent of the meta game. Mm-hmm. And then it's like a bunch of stuff that's like three and a half to four yeah. percent, and then it falls off to you know around two. Yeah. So it's not like there's one deck that is twenty five percent of the meta game. It's, right. It's not standard. It's kind of play what you want, though. I will say there is a there are a lot of pictures of Loris <laughs> as you scroll are, down. Yeah. The reason that I went to MTG top eight as well is I have found that the Goldfish metagame gets skewed really easily. So it's not always accurate. Okay. Like, sometimes it's not even close to accurate. That's why I kind of went to the two different places. So just keep that in. Like, if you're trying to track a metagame on Goldfish, just keep that in mind. Um, I think, like, anybody that runs a tournament can report to Goldfish. Gotcha. Including, like unofficial places like i think when i was looking through some of the events i came across an event that was run on like one of the auxiliary like digital like a cockatrice or whatever like it wasn't even run with actual cards gotcha so just keep that in mind when you're going through the the goldfish metagame is that uh people can kind of post up in there whatever they want there's no criteria for like legitimizing anything. Gotcha. Okay. So like I said, I broke this kind of up into pillars, which are pillars are really just like buckets to put decks in. So you can kind of formulate a game plan. And the first kind of bucket that I put some decks into was the big mana decks. These are decks that are looking to mit, like a, like the bucket says, is just make a whole bunch of mana. Tron is the typical pillar that occupies most of this area and right now we have two different tron decks so what's a what's a tron deck so tron is where you're trying to assemble the three urza's lands Mm -hmm. urza's mine urza's tower and urza's power plant i did this in rebel order but that's right mine power plant tower uh, when they are all on the battlefield they go from making one colorless mana each to mm-hmm. mine and power plant make two and tower makes three. So you can tap right. all three and make seven mana. And it just so happens that uh, uh, Karn liberated yep. costs seven mana. Big so they, Karn. Play, they cast the big Karn and it starts out with a ton of loyalty and they just can either blow up a permanent that's bothering them or tick up and take a card out of your hand. Right. And if they tick up, like it's almost impossible to kill it with damage because it's like yeah, there's nine no at way that point, yeah, or something. So they're just trying to get those three lands on the battlefield and play a Karn or a yep. Worm Coil, a Worm Coil Engine six six Life Link Death Touch, and when it dies, it makes a three three Life Linker and a three three Death Toucher. Yeah, it's just kind of a sticky colorless threat. Yeah, and then other like big colorless things. Ulamogs Ugin. and Ugins. Yeah. Yep. So those kind of things. And so it has yep. ways to facilitate that and gets through its deck and then just ways to find the lands. Yep. Currently, that deck is green for Ancient Stirrings. I don't th- think that there's any other green cards that the deck plays. Often it plays Sylvan Scrying, but I don't know if it's Oh, yeah, Sylvan on- Scrying. Yeah, so it should still be on Sylvan Scrying. So it usually plays... Like eight green cards and then chromatic star and chromatic sphere yep. as ways to generate that uh, colored mana. And I'll play a couple cards, forests too. Yeah. And those cards get you, th- uh, draw you a card as well. So they get you through your deck. Right. To find the pieces that you're missing. Yep. In the past, there was also a red green version of this deck. Do you remember what the red was for? Fire spouts. Oh, really? really? Go really far back. Right. Th- that's two red green hybrid right and if you oh, pay yeah, red yeah. it deals damage to creatures on the ground if you pay green it deals damage to creatures in the air that's yep. the old old thing it was for but it was usually red for a sweeper of some sort yeah 
I remember the decks playing uh, Groves of the Burn Willows, but I don't. I didn't remember why they were red. Yeah, so Fire Spouts was the was the old timey reason. I'm sure yeah. that like it would be you know, uh, flame flame sweep now, or yeah. or something like that. Yeah, but they yeah. would usually play red for sweepers. There were times that it played black mm-hmm. for sweepers as well. Like I could see it, like you know, being green black to like play extinction event or something. Yeah, like an and splash sweeper. Occasionally, you'll see a blue variant pop up. Um, on. That's really old time. Really, so yeah. That uh, plays a bunch of counter spells like condescend. Mm-hmm. Uh, that are like blue and X because yeah. uh, presumably you're going to have a ton of mana. Right. And then would play Gifts Ungiven mm-hmm. to go get Unburial Rights and like Elishnorn or Iona and just lock you out of the game. Yeah. And it could occasionally just cast those big cards because it made a ton of mana. Tons of mana. Yeah. So that's like super old timey like if someone play, if you ever run into someone who's playing Blue Tron, they've been playing for fifteen years, and they've probably been playing since, Blue Tron since for modern 15 years. started. Yes, yeah, they've been playing yeah. Blue Tron since modern started. Yeah. So, the slightly more aggressive version of Tron is Eldrazi Tron. Yeah, I think currently both Goldfish and MTG Top Eight have E Tron in a slightly higher percentage than Green Tron. But it kind of ebbs and flows. Like sometimes Eldrazi Tron's really good. Sometimes Green Tron's better. It just kind of depends on what the rest of the meta looks like. Eldrazi Tron is a little bit more disruptive because they can turn to uh, Thought Knots here for a little bit of interaction. But it basically plays all the Tron pieces like Green Tron does. And then it also plays Eldrazi Temple and a bunch of Eldrazi's. It's really not looking to go all the way up to like 10 mana like uh, Green Tron is. It's mainly playing in the like four to six mana area where they play like Thought Not Seers and Reality Smashers and stuff like that. I think the biggest difference between the two decks is Chalice of the Void. Right? Yeah, a lot of yes. times if if Chalice of the Void is good, if there's a bunch of mm-hmm. one mana things, then yep. Eltrazi Tron is probably better than regular Tron. Mm-hmm. If Chalice isn't good, then it goes the other way, where right. Big Tron is better. And that's yep. usually because when Chalice is good, it's because you're playing against a bunch of aggressive low to the ground decks that have a bunch of one drops. Mm-hmm. And those are the decks that Tron does worst against. Right. And so you're like, oh, Chalice fixes my problems. So I play yep. Chalice. So yep. those are the, the differences. And then. The other big mana deck are the Primeval Titan decks. Yeah, and there's a couple different like Primeval Titan decks too, but they do very similar things, so I just kind of lumped them both together. Yeah, I mean, um, in, in the end, you're just trying to like get to six mana and cast a Primeval Titan, Titan and then profit. Right. It doesn't really matter. Like You just go get whatever lands you need to win the game at that point. Right. So it's like, um, how do you want to win? And how do you want to yeah. get to six? So like Brian said, you're trying to get to six man and cast a primeval Titan, which is four green green for a six six. When it ETBs and attacks, you get to tutor up two lands and put them into play tapped. So the amulet Titan decks run amulet of vigor to kind of turn bounce lands into fast mana. And also make it so that when the prime time ETBs, the lands enter untapped. And it can kind of combo kill with, was it Slayer Stronghold and what, what's the other one? Uh, Boros Garrison? Boros and Gar- Garrison, yeah. So you can... Yeah. Boros Garrison makes Red White as a bounce land. And then Slayer Stronghold gives something double strike and haste Yeah. for Red White. So they come into yeah. play and with the bounce trigger on the stack... You tap for red white. Then you give mm-hmm. your prime time haste, and you can attack for. Uh, I think it's fourteen. I think it's plus one plus zero. Oh, haste and yeah, double strike maybe. or something. Yeah. I, some, for some reason, the number fourteen feels right. Yeah. But even if that doesn't kill them, you get two more lands, which will then give you a way to kill them. Right. Yeah. Right. At you that eventually point, find a way to kill them. Yeah. 
Yep, you've done enough damage. Yes. And then the other decks are Valakut decks, where you're looking to stick a Valakut. If you was it eight or seven or more mountains, whenever a mountain enters yes. a battlefield, if you have seven or more mountains, you could get a lightning bolt something. Yeah. So these often play like Dryad of the Elysian Grove because it makes all your lands all mountains. Mana, all mountains. So yeah. even your Valakut at that point counts as being a mountain, so it counts itself. Yep. So in prime time is just like the best way to get lands out of your deck. Yeah. Right. So you can go tutor up two Valakuts and two mountains or whatever. Yeah. And you just, you win. So, yep. right, you have a 6-6 six, six that can kill them, plus you eat your Valakut, and now any land you play or any mountain you play is a lightning bolt. Right. And that is usually enough to beat someone. A lot of times, like, if control can keep you off of, like, killing them with prime time, eventually just the fact that all of your lands are lightning bolts yeah. will win you the game mm -hmm. because of your Valakut. So. Yeah, not so much the Amulet Titan decks, but the Valakut decks tend to play a lot of, like, extra land drop cards, too. Yes. So that's kind of one way to tell the difference between the two. Yeah, like Growth Spiral and Explore. Yeah. Plus, like, Dryad of the Elysium Grove just gives you extra land drops as well. So it kind of all rolled in. Yep. All right, so those are your big mana decks. And mm -hmm. those are... The decks that are trying to, you know, as the phrase goes, go over the top. Just do yep. something so big that it doesn't matter. And they get a lot of value out of their lands, whether their lands are going to give them creatures to block with, or they're going to give them lightning bolts, or whatever. Yeah. They're getting advantage out of their lands, or their mm -hmm. land's going to let them tutor up a card that lets them then go get a prime time. Right. Right. There's a lot of things that their lands let them do. Yep. Right. And if you've ever uh, been on the receiving end of a big car and then you know how how bad that feels and what going over the top means. <laughs> yeah, so I the first time I played against Karn, like my opponent just like always had turn three Tron and Karn and I was just like, How do you ever beat this deck? This is amazing. <laughs> and I've played more and I know that it has like the typical ramp deck fail case of like, oh, I drew my uh, big things but I didn't get Tron right. or I drew my I ramped but then I ramped into nothing but right. when your opponent just goes like I'm going to mulligan to five and then just have turn three Tron and then play their Karn you're just like mm -hmm. this deck can never lose <laughs> <laughs> can't ever beat it can't ever beat it but it does have a fail case Yeah, but yeah these are the like I said these are the decks that kind of go over the top of things Mm -hmm. Next up, we have the control decks. Yeah. On both lists, uh, Goldfish and MTG Top 8, they listed an Esper control deck. But I had thought the de facto control deck for Modern right now was Jeskai. So did I. But, like, I've seen a lot of people casting, like, watching videos and stuff, casting uh, Kaya's Command or Kaya's Guile. Yeah. Uh, which is like a black white card. So mm -hmm. like if I think of that card's good, maybe you get more Esper. Yeah. Um I mean, and Goldfish also just has like a straight blue white list at two percent as well. Oh, okay. That wasn't there when I when I made this list. That must I, have been I a recent you. edition. Yeah. But I mean they're all kind of right, they're all the same deck, if that makes any sense. In that, yeah, like, in that there's, like, a core of, like, cantrips, like, opt seer missions, removal, like, path, and then whatever colors you splash into typically is just there to give you better removal and interaction. Right. So if you go into red, you get lightning here, like, some bolt. If you go into black, you get things like thought seize, fatal push, maybe now, like, a couple, like, vanishing verse, things like that. Mm -hmm. um kaya's guile um kaya's guile. and then they almost all play cryptic command yeah and some number like four cryptic commands some number of snapcaster mages yep 
what probably being blue white gives you that the three color decks don't is letting you play Archmage's Charm. The blue blue um, blue. I think the Esper list that I looked at had Archmage's Charm. Probably. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you can like play like you know a ton of them, but it's blue this blue Esper blue. list has four of them. Okay, well then the mana is better than I'm thinking. But it's blue blue blue. You can counter a spell. You can steal something with mana value one or zero or one or less. Yeah, uh, one or less. And then um, you can draw two cards. Yeah, I mean if you can afford blue 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 for cryptic, you can probably afford blue 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 for Eric Mage's charm. This is true. And then. They're basically a bunch of planeswalkers from 2019. <laughs> Teferi's, yeah. Yeah, your Teferi, Narset, five mana Teferi sometimes, and yep. like some number of Jays. Yep. Right. So they're winning the game off usually planeswalker activations. A lot. Uh, if you're blue white, a lot of times you're going to try to win with Celestial Colonnade. Yeah, it's a man land that turns into a 4-4 flying vigilant thing to clock your opponent with. And um, uh, like the the Jeskai decks, often like uh, you'll hear people say like bolt, snap, bolt. Yeah. You know, you're at like eight. And at the end of your turn, they're like bolt you, snapcaster mage, bolt you. And now they have you're at two and they have a two power creature. So they'll sometimes nickel and dime you with you know, lightning bolts and um, uh, lightning helixes. So they oftentimes are a little bit more aggressive and they Mm -hmm. give you another axis to worry about. Where against like blue white, like it's colonnade and like Teferi ult. Right. And, you know, Esper is probably similar because like there's no like kind of burn in black to kind of get the job done that way. So they're just going to try to like kill you with planeswalkers where, there are burn spells in Jess Guy, so you know, if you go too happy, you know, you know, fetch shock thought sees, well, okay, now the game plan might go from, oh, I'm gonna try to like win this game with the fairy to okay, they're at fifteen. I can bolt snap bolt. Now they're at nine, now they've got to deal with a snapcaster mage, and I have other stuff going on as well. Right. So it's got a little bit it's able to like kinda uh turn the switch and turn the corner a little faster. Yeah, Jeskai also recently got Cleansing Wildfire. I know like LSV was big on this for a little while. I'm not sure if it's fallen out of favor or not. But you can Cleansing Wildfire with like Flagstones of Trocare for another form of like ramp and card advantage. And so. it also, uh, control decks oftentimes have a hard time with big mana decks. Yeah. Because, right, you have to answer everything one for one. And, you know, against like a creature deck, if a 2-2 two, two or a 4-4 four, four sneaks through, it's not the end of the world, right? You have a Wrath or yeah. something. Right? You got some time to sweep it up. Yeah, but everything in like the big mana decks is so big and so yeah. impactful that if any one thing sneaks through, you get so far behind, it's hard to catch up. Yeah, game so, just ends. Yeah, so the control decks are usually set up that they have a lot of cheap interaction to deal with like the creature decks they have sweepers and then general answers to kind of deal with other types of problem permanents. Yep. And, you know, having cleansing wildfire to let you, you know, just in your main deck deal with Tron. Yeah. You know, is, is pretty, is a pretty good place to be. So Mm -hmm. these decks are all about answers and they just have kind of the best answers. Like their answers generate an advantage too. like cryptic command does more than just answer a, you know, answer a problem. Yeah, it draws them a card. Or yeah. like, if you're looking for a wrath, right? You can tap your opponent's team and draw a card. Mm-hmm. Try to get closer to the wrath, right? And give yourself another turn, and then yep. you can do it again the next turn, maybe. And it gives mm-hmm. you a couple turns to find your wrath, so yep. that you're not so far behind. Yep. Right. It just lets you kind of hang on, and then and then kind of get there. Mm-hmm. But these are um, the the biggest thing for Modern Horizons 2 for control decks is counterspell. Right right yeah, now, that two huge. mana counterspell slot is held down by Mana Leak, which in yeah. Modern a lot of times is just counterspell. Mm-hmm. But like if you're playing against Tron, maybe you can get the first thing, but you're probably not going to get the second thing with Mana Leak. Right. 
right? Because they're just going to have too much mana. Man, with all the crazy Modern Horizons 2 spoilers, I forgot that Light Counter Spell was even in the conversation. Yeah, but now <laughs> like, it's going to affect their mana base some, but honestly, if you're playing Archmage's Charm in your three-color deck, I'm yeah. pretty sure you're just playing Counter Spell as well. Like, I'm Yeah, sure I mean, it, it looks like all of the mana in these Esper decks makes blue. Yeah. Like, they play one planes that doesn't make blue mana. Everything else just makes blue mana. Yeah, and I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, like, people are like, well, I don't know if the counter spell is good enough because uh, double blue. And it's like, they're playing blue, 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 three drop, and then blue, 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 four drop. I think they're going to have blue, blue on two. Because yeah. then yeah. they, if they don't, they can't play blue, 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 three drop. So, yeah. I mean, like this deck's playing Logic Knots also, which are blue, blue on turn two, so. Yeah. So, basically, you're looking at the 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 answer deck. Right? Yep. This is just the deck that's trying to answer everything and get to a point where they have four or five cards in hand and you have none. And, mm -hmm. they, ha and they have two answers for everything that you're going to draw off the top of your deck for the rest of the game. Yep. And eventually, they will find some Planeswalkery ham sandwich to kill you with. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, I've lost to... I have certainly lost to Snapcaster Mage Beats. Yes. I'm at 18 and they have a Snapcaster. I have nine turns to uh, not win this game. Let's go. That's right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So next up, we have the aggro decks. Yeah. And these are kind of the straight aggro decks. There are like some disruptive-ish aggro decks also, but like these are kind of just pure aggro decks. Um, so I wanted to keep these a little bit separate. Like the disruptive aggro decks get kind of muddy when you start trying to describe them in certain terms because a lot of times they can play different roles. So I kind of left those to their own, like miscellaneous. We'll call them potpourri, their own potpourri category. So in the aggro decks, uh, first up, I've got Boros Burn, which is just kind of the default burn deck that's been around like for basically ever. Yeah. So basically. This deck has not really changed in the last like six years. Yeah, I mean, it got some Bait Canyon from Modern Horizons 2. And Skewer the and Critics. Skewer the Critics from Guilds, yeah. And that's basically it. So it's Goblin Guide, Swiss Spear, and Eidolon of the Great Rebels. And then any card that costs one mana mm -hmm. that says deal three damage. Right. That doesn't have like some horrific drawback. Yep. And then two two mana cards uh one that says deal four and one that says deal three gain three and that's <laughs> basically the deck it's they all all the cards are the exact same card yeah right they all just do the same thing basically so, so the horizon lands let you not flood out mm -hmm. right so the biggest thing with burn is you would like you know get your opponent to like five yeah. And then draw land, land, and die. Yep. With, you know, looking at it, they have five horizon lands in this list. So you have five redraws. So like a quarter of your lands just let you look for or not that card. card. Yeah. Yeah. Just not that card. I need something that says deal three damage on it. Mm -hmm. This was like the starter deck for every like modern player. Yeah, it's super cheap to get into, and like it, like you said, it really doesn't change either. Okay, uh, to just calibrate everyone real quick, how much does the super cheap burn deck cost? Well, I'm looking at it right now, so it's not really a fair question. Yeah, five hundred and fifty-five dollars. It's super cheap. Well, right for a modern deck, though, that's like a fire yeah. sale. Yeah, for a modern deck, yeah, but it's just like, just you know, ma magic economy five. Well, I mean, these prices are going to come down, too, because, Hopefully. like, half of this deck is six fetch lands. Yeah. So yeah, I guess when I Modern guess Horizon true. 2 comes out, then it'll be a $300 deck. Yeah, so... Which is less than a standard deck, so... Yeah. <laughs> and a, a lot of it is commons and uncommons. There's a few rares, but nothing. Yeah. When I got into the deck, Goblin Guides were $20. I think Goblin Guides are, like, 5 or 10 six. now. Yeah. 6 yeah, like goblin guys so. were like the big were the big thing. Yeah, lava spike. Even though it was reprinted, is still three dollars for a common. 
we did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like most of the spells are under ten dollars. Like all the, yeah. all of the spells are under ten dollars. It's just the lands are where the bulk of the land uh, money is. So like decks like burn kind of prey on control decks, where if you can get them dead before they get their feet under them, mm-hmm. like that's your whole goal. Or is you want to yeah. get them? You want to get them to like three, and then have a turn where you're like. Deal three to you. Okay, you countered it. Deal three again. You countered it. Deal three again. Okay, you ran out of counters. I win. Yeah. Right. Like usually um, they're doing something like that. Yeah, they also have a pretty good matchup against people that are being greedy with their mana base, because yeah. greedy mana bases in modern tend to be very painful. So yeah. if you're you know dealing six damage to yourself, fetch shock, fetch shock, then it's a lot easier for burn to finish you off. They're in a point. Where they're in a position where they can kill you pretty easily. Right? Yeah, like the philosophy of fire was what you want to cast seven spells. Yeah, that eat that deal three damage each to to you know deal twenty one, mm-hmm. and so now you've taken that you know from seven spells to five. Right, right, and that's all. That's pretty easy to do. Mm-hmm. Right, so so that's burn, and then kind of the new. Hotness in the according to Goldfist, the deck with the highest percentage. Yeah. Is uh is it Blitz? Yeah, so, and this is like kind of a it, I mean it doesn't run Delver, but it's kind of a Delvery deck where you're playing like a little bit tempo y and a little aggressive. I, I mean the the deck is very aggressive, but it plays a little bit of a tempo game. Yeah, this is another deck that is much cheaper than I thought it would have been. It's yeah, it's super cheap. 270. So right it kind of plays like burn as well. But 270. It's two, 268 or sorry, 568. Yeah. Reading's okay. hard. Numbers numbers hard. Yeah. <laughs> I have I'm a doctor. Numbers are hard. Um <laughs> I draw pictures. I count to 4 and I stop. Uh, carbon makes four bonds. I'm all done. <laughs> um, so it kind of relies on the same, some of the same things as burn where it's mm-hmm. casting spells that deal damage to your opponent, mm-hmm. but it's more reliant on its creatures. It's playing yeah. a lot of under costed prowess creatures yep. to make it. So it spells deal more damage than they say on the card. Yeah, it makes the spells more impactful. Yes. If your lightning bolt not only deals three, but gives plus two, plus two to your team, or plus one, plus one to your team, then that's a that's a pretty good lightning bolt. Yeah, so like a, you know, Soul Scarf's Mage into Swift Spear, Lightning Bolt you, like mm-hmm. that deals uh, seven damage on turn two. Yeah. Right? And now your opponent's on the back foot, and they like, if they fetch shocked, well, right now Half they're their at- life is gone. Yeah, now they're at 10, and your deck is just set up to deal 20 damage. Yeah, heaven so, forbid they thought sees you also. Yeah, so it has, like, Sprite Dragon as, like, a cheap threat that grows. It has Stormwing Entity as something that you can play on the cheap. Man, both of those cards sound really familiar. They are in standard right now. <laughs> I think he also told you guys to buy a bunch of Sprite Dragons because they're $4 a pop or $5 a pop. For the cheap version, yeah. For the cheap version. Yeah, yeah, we told you to buy some like perfect pets. We had your yeah. back. So so basically it's ways to just maximize your your spells. And the other card that's really good in these kind of decks, because there's basically a version of this, it's a little bit less aggressive in um historic. So I've played mm-hmm. against a lot of expressive iterations. Yeah. Like, on turn three, that card just is draw two for two mana. The card's great. Yeah. so As long know, as you can take turn three off. Yeah, but, like, in this deck, if you go, like, prowess creature into, like, double prowess creature, or prowess oh, creature yeah. into sprite dragon, you're not yeah. taking turn three off. You're, like, right. pumping your team, hopefully getting a land, and then casting another spell. Yeah, lightning bolt or something. Yeah, yeah anything. It also is, like, the best lava dart deck. Mm-hmm. Right, because Lava Dart gives you two spells for free. Right. So, like, one mana deal one doesn't sound good, but, you know, with three prowess creatures, it's like 
one mana deal eight. Right. And that sounds real good. So yep. it is the deck that is just trying to get you dead. And it just, it has a little bit more play to it than burn, I think. Yeah. So I think that's why it's so popular. I think. Yeah. People, it also, it gets a little disruptive out of the sideboard too. Yeah. Where burn really doesn't. It gets a little disruptive. So like this deck has a threads of disloyalty in it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it has a threads of disloyalty because it lets you beat core uh, Firewalker. Oh, so it okay. lets you steal enchant creature with converted mana cost two or less. You control enchanted creature. That's just there for core Firewalker. Yep. So you're just like, yep, take that. Now yep. I don't have to worry about you gaining life. So it just has a little bit more play than than uh, the red white deck does. And I think people really just love like casting serum visions and cantrips in general. Mm hmm. And like burn yeah, doesn't have throw that. your spells around. Yeah, like burn, you're a little more uh, beholden to the top, like like your seven card hand plus like your top four cards in your deck. Mm-hmm. Like, like if those cards aren't great, you just ugh. this. You yeah. have a little bit of manipulation, and you can do a little bit more. Yeah. And then the other deck is what did you call it? Red prowess. Um. So. The Mono Red Prowess deck didn't show up on Goldfish, but I knew it was a deck, and that's actually when I decided that I needed to start checking MTG Top 8, because typically, like, if you guys had listened to us for a while, when we're working through learning a format or, you know, learning a new metagame, um, MTG Top 8's a pretty good place to look because they they post, like, I don't I don't know what the right way to say it is, like, legitimate tournament results like the, there's a results and i think like they also post a lot more tournaments from like around the world yeah not just here yeah and gold goldfish is a lot of times focused more on like uh, leagues on magic online mm-hmm. where i think that like uh top eight is more focused on like paper tournament results wherever yeah. those are happening yeah yep so red prowess so- is kind of just it's very similar to to the blue red deck but it's mono red instead yeah so it's got some more burn elements to it but it is taking advantage of like swift spear and uh uh, soul scar mage does it play a kiln fiend not kiln fiend oh gosh what is it called uh bedlam reveler no the the one in the red gets a counter runaway steamkin there we go. Oh, uh, probably. Yeah, like it gets to play a little bit different stuff, but it is still trying to do the same thing. Yeah, they get to play Blood Moon too. Yeah, which uh, that deck, that version's better if Blood Moon's good. Yeah. Uh, again, like these kind of try to prey on the big mana decks, right? Because they're for the first few turns usually not doing anything, mm-hmm. and you can get their life total low. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like most of them are Obosh decks now. Yeah. Yeah, you just get to play a bunch of, like, one-mana things. So mm-hmm. all the burn spells, Blood Moon, Light Up the Stage, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, like, one thing that, like, these decks burn, and probably um, Blue-Red, and maybe if you're willing to give up Obosh, is going to get from the new set is Flame Rift. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a huge pickup. Like, one-mana deal for is a big deal. Yeah. And... You know, I said I don't. I said last time I don't think it'll do anything good for the format. And what I mean by that is just like it's gonna make a lot more games where like you die on turn four. Yeah. Right, like because you're gonna like pass the turn at eight, and your opponent's gonna be like Boros Charm Flame Rift. Yeah. And you'll be like, oh, I I thought I was gonna have like a turn. Pack okay. them up. Yeah. So I think it's just going to do a lot of that where you're just, Mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of games that end a turn faster than you're used to them ending. Right. Yeah. That, that one damage means a lot. The one extra damage. It does. Like the reason that like red, that red, white, but Boros burn is a deck is because of Boros charm. Yeah. Right. Like uh, red, white burn might just become mono red. Mm-hmm. Because it wouldn't surprise me. Because Flame Rift just takes the Boros Charm slot, and you're getting four damage. Or it could go to 
you know, stay Boros and just be like, all right, some searing bloods go away because I need, I just want to deal four to the face. Like, I don't care about your creatures. Who cares? Yeah. So these are all your aggressive decks. Mm-hmm. And like and- I said, that doesn't count the, uh, like the disruptive aggro decks. Those are kind of something a little bit different. We'll talk about them in a minute. Yeah. Okay. Now we have the combo decks. Well, and, to be fair, it's combo with a question mark because some is. of these are pretty loosely combo, but they all kind of have combo elements. So I kind of lumped them all together. Yeah. So the first one is Heliod Company. Yep. And Heliod Company, I've heard talk that it might be the best deck in the format, but I okay. don't know how accurate that is. Uh, you know, we kind of with the results of it being kind of the third or fourth most represented deck on goldfish i guess the fifth most represented deck but basically you're trying to assemble uh heliod with one of two cards Mm -hmm. you either want to have a walking ballista yep and you give it lifelink with heliod and then you just machine gun down your opponent and you win the game yep you start shooting yep because every time you deal a damage, it gets a counter from Heliod, and so you can just do infinite damage. You just need, like, two counters on the Walking Ballista. Yep. And then the other card you want is Spike Feeder, mm-hmm. which is a random card that was, like, time-shifted, which is the only yep. reason it's in Modern. Yep, so time-shifted. One green green for an oh oh Oh, yeah. Ooh. It enters play Those with two. Those are the two. best stats. Yeah. It enters play with a plus one, with two plus one plus one counters. Yep. You can pay two and remove a plus one plus one counter from Spike Feeder and put a counter on something else. But mm-hmm. what really matters is you remove a plus one plus one counter and you gain two life. So, oh, that just goes infinite with Heliod, right? Yes. So yeah. with Spike Feeder, you gain infinite life, uh, which against the aggro decks gives you checks notes infinite time uh yep. they can never kill you right um and then if you get walking ballista out you just win the game because of just damage mm-hmm. and so it plays i guess this is where ranger captain of eos comes in this is a way to find your walking ballista yep that you can hit off company yes and then it plays collected company and then ways to like accelerate. So Arbor Elf and Utopia Sprawl. Yep. So, you know, you can go turn one Arbor Elf, turn two land Utopia Sprawl and class cast a collected company on turn two. Yeah. And Ooh, that's gross. Yeah. And like, then just have the wind set up on turn three. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, if you hit like Ranger Captain and, Heliod, then you just win the next turn. Yeah, Dunzo. It also has like Conclave Mentor Mm -hmm. as ways to get extra counters on things, right? Right. To kind of accelerate you to the like, because like usually you have to have six mana to win with Walking Ballista because you need two counters on Walking Ballista plus giving it lifelink. Right. With a Conclave Mentor out, you only need four mana. Mm hmm. And the deck has a reasonable B plan of just, like, beats. Yeah, I mean, the the creatures don't hit super hard, but they're, like, mildly disruptive as well. So, yeah, you can absolutely just win with beats. Yeah, you have Skyclave Apparition. Yep. Uh, and, like, Oriok Champion against, like, the red decks. And just, there's a, there's a lot of ways for you to, like, kind of slow your opponent down and get your combo together. Mm-hmm. It does a lot of different stuff. So this is yeah. one that just like can uh, kind of win out of nowhere, but then also has the ability to kind of like grind and stay mm-hmm. together. Yeah, um, it kind of turns into a bad beat down deck. Yeah. So like if your combo gets broken up, and what's really nice is one of your combo pieces is indestructible. Yeah, that's and nice. doesn't get hit by a path unless you like put enough mana symbols on the battlefield. So, yeah, like, and you, like it's reasonably easy to turn it on too if you need to turn it on. Yeah, yeah, it just kind of has all the bases covered and just can like, oops, I win on turn three or turn four pretty consistently. Mm-hmm. 
when you're casting a spell that looks at the top six cards of your uh, deck to find your combo pieces. Yeah. It's probably pretty okay. Man, that card's good. Yes. Yes. Uh, bring the light scape shift. Yeah, this is... Well, I mean, looking at it, I don't know if I'd call this a scape shift deck, but that's how they had it described. Um, okay. I mean, it has scape shift in it, and scape shift decks are kind of looking to win the same way that the um, the Valakut primetime decks are looking to win, where you turn all your lands into mountains with Dry to the Elysian Grove, and then get a Valakut. And then instead of using prime time to put a bunch of lands into play, they'll scape shift and go get, you know, six lands all at once or seven lands all at once or whatever and trigger all the Valakuts and just win all at once. But these decks are also Omnoth decks. So they have, you know, pretty serious I, I might even call the scape shift plan the B plan. Their their main plan is, you know, just a bunch of value with Omnath and some planeswalkers and stuff. Yeah. So uh I know we probably brought this up before. The the weird rulesy interaction with Scape Shift and Velicut mm-hmm. is if you get to seven lands and mm-hmm. you cast a scape shift, um, I guess it's six mountains or more triggers because you needed seven lands to win. So you get yeah. a Velicut. It, it's it, uh five, five other mountains. Five other mountains, and you get six mountains yeah. and yeah. that would deal eighteen damage. Yep. Because the way it works is all the mountains come in at the same time. Right. So each mountain sees the other mountains on the battlefield and yep. goes, oh, I get to deal three. So your six Boom. mountains each get to deal three because they all came in at the same time. Yeah. So these are like a race to get to seven. And having Bring the Light gives you more copies of your scape shift, plus gives you access to whatever toolboxy stuff you want in your deck. I'll go ahead. If you like if you have a drag of the Elysian Grove, you don't need seven, right? You only need six because then this the yeah. the Valakut counts. And you can double up. You can get like two Valakuts and they're both mountains. Yeah, and then like you just like deal a million. Yeah. I don't know if I can count that high. We established I can't count to like five hundred, so yeah, I that's it's high. a lot. So yeah, it's a lot. It, well, it it's over twenty, so it doesn't. Once you're yeah. over twenty, it doesn't matter. You're usually pretty good. So it has like a, the combo finish, but it also has, like you said, the the grindy elements plus like this toolboxy like way to be like, oh, I can put in like one card that like what is it, sewing salt or what was the the devoid one that was like destroy crumble to a, dust, crumble to dust, like destroy a land and exile all copies of it. Mm-hmm. From their from their deck, so you can like blow up all the Tron lands, right? And but you only need like one copy of it because you have the um, the bring the lights that can go find it. Yep. So like it just gives you the ability to be like, what is the thing I need now that I've got my five mana? I need this. Yep. Okay, I can go get that. Yep, go get it. Next up is Dredge. So yeah, I mean it, it's not like truly a combo deck, but it kind of is. Yeah, I mean, you're not casting any of those idiots unless, like, things have gone horribly. So, Dredge uses the Dredge mechanic. So, it's cards that have Dredge. If they're in your graveyard, they have Dredge in a number. And you get to put that many cards on on top of your library into your graveyard. And you return the Dredge card to your hand. So, Mm -hmm. Stinkweed Imp says Dredge 5. So, if it's in your graveyard, if you go to draw a card, you put five cards in your graveyard and you return stink weed empty your hand. So yeah. you want to mill yourself for value mm-hmm. and you want to do this as quickly as humanly possible. Yep. So, so big dredge numbers are good. Yes. Well, which is why they banned my boy grave troll. Um, Poor guy. He had the biggest numbers. So we get to play with stink weed imp, uh, Golgari uh, thug, which has dredge four life from the loam that has dredge three. And mm-hmm. I don't know if there's, a, I don't think I'm missing another dredger. And so the way that you dredge now is Cathartic Reunion and the new card from Strixhaven, uh, Thrilling Possibility. Yeah. Is that it? Or Thrilling yep. Discovery? Yeah, Thrilling Possibility. Uh, well, actually, they no. might be on Thrilling Discovery now. Yeah, they're, they're on the, the white one. The yeah. Red, white. Thrill- thrilling Discovery. Thrilling Discovery. So yeah. they both slightly differently discard two and then draw three mm-hmm. so if you discard two dredgers your first draw you dredge for the first one 
then when you go to do your second draw, you get to look and see, did I dredge any better dredgers than what I put in here? Mm -hmm. And if you did, you get to dredge with that. Yep. So each draw, you get to look and dredge again. Yep. Do that, and you're trying to flip over your deck to get Narcomoebas back into play. If they go from your library to your graveyard, they trigger and come into play. Mm -hmm. they, and then uh, that triggers uh, prized amalgams. If you milled any prized amalgams, you'll get prized amalgams back. Yeah. They have Creeping Chill, which mm -hmm. mills and deals three. That is what they are doing. Yeah. And creeping so, Chills do most of the work, I think, right? A lot and of times the, now, yeah. yeah. They're doing a lot more of the work. Yeah. And then yeah. you also have like some value engines built in with Life from the Loam. Uh, like Brian said, you can dredge back to Life from the Loam to get the dredge party going, but you can also use Life from the Loam to like fill your hand back up with random garbage lands and then pitch those lands to conflagrates that you have um, in your graveyard, like milled over. Conflagrate, uh, the part that matters for this is red, red, discard X cards, deal X damage, divide it as you want among any number of targets. So yep. sometimes you're just like, you're at, you're at eight. Cool, I will yep. eat you. Yep. Or you might just be like, oh, you're playing Heliod Company and you have like uh, three two twos. Um, I guess I'm going to kill all three of your two twos on my second yeah. turn or whatever. Okay, now you, you're you you're held up and I've got all my dredgers in my graveyard again. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a combo deck, kind of a weird value-y deck. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know how, how to kind of classify it. But, yeah, it, it's weird. It, it was closer to combo than anything else, so that's what I called it. Yeah, no, that's fine. Next up is Through the Breach. Yep, so, and this is like just a combo deck. This is like the truest combo deck you can think of. See, I I guess it depends on how it's built. Because like, I think of the Through the Breach decks as like kind of a combo control deck. Where they're uh, playing, yeah. they're playing counter spells and trying to get to a point where they can just like know the coast is clear to through the breach Emrakul and 15 you and blow up all your permanents. But they're playing... That's true. I guess these ones are playing like Cryptics and Archmage's Charm, so that makes it a lot closer to a control deck. And like Remand. So this is yeah. just like, I'm going to kill your stuff. I'm going to bounce your stuff. And eventually I'm going to find my Emrakul and my Through the Breach, and I'm going to win the game with that. Yeah. It also has sneaky best combo c card in the last year in it. Yeah, what's that? Valakut Awakening. Oh, yeah. Just yep. like, hey, shuffle all this stuff on the bottom. Like, you have a bunch of garbage. I need a Through the Breach and an Emrakul. Mm -hmm. And if you don't so you've need you've got it, one or the other. and Yeah, it's a land. That's interesting. They uh, On Goldfish, they're like, this has 22 lands plus four MDFCs. So huh. Like it actually That's has twenty six lands, yeah. Because the Valakut Awakenings are not counting as lands, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but they're basically just trying to hold the fort long enough to then kill you. Yeah. Sometimes do they have them in the sideboard? They probably are too blue. Another version of this deck is like Blue Moon. Yeah. Where, Where they run Blood Moons. Yeah, they run Blood Moon. Sometimes they don't have the Through the Reach Emrakul. They might just like... It's, they're a stronger control deck, but they're trying to like get a bunch of card advantage by playing like a Blood Moon. I was looking to see if Blood Moon was in here. Yeah, I don't see any of these lists that have Blood Moon in them. Yeah. Do you see, do you see the, the sweet combo in the sideboard? Madcap Experiment Platinum Imperium? Platinum Imperium, yeah. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> the okie doke. Yeah. Oh, you're right about Emrakul? No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So these are kind of fall on like their combo control. They like our control deck with a combo finish. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I and guess I should have lo actually looked at the list before I started describing them. I was thinking of the old through the breach lists. Yeah. That just was like all in. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's too hard to be all in with how aggressive like, like the list deck is. Like yeah. I can't imagine like just being like, I'm not going to do anything on the first three turns to like set myself up. So like yeah. you're just dead. Yeah. Or like, you know, cantrip, cantrip, can oh, I'm dead. <laughs> right? Like I just can't imagine that being a thing that you're that is okay to do now. Right? Yeah. 
And then we have Niftalite, mm-hmm. which is kind of combo. It might be the closest thing or one of the closest things we have to like a mid-range deck. Just a mid-range deck, yeah. Where you're playing niv Mizzet Reborn and then uh, a bunch of uh, multicolored spells. And yeah, then bring just the so light. you can find off Niv. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, you're hoping to kind of hold the fort and then, like, land a Niv somehow. Either mm-hmm. through Bring the Light or from just drawing it and casting it. And being like, okay, I have a 6-6 six, six and I drew five cards. Mm-hmm. Now I'm stabilized and I have a bunch of resources you can't win. Yeah. And, like, the, the Bring the Lights let you get... Um, bullets yeah you're like oh i have a a wrath i have a kaya's wrath so if i get the five mana i know i can get my wrath or i guess it'd be a supreme mm-hmm. verdict supreme verdict yeah yeah or uh oh i need an answer to this planeswalker well i have a dread boar that i can go search for yeah or whatever whatever bullet you you have mm-hmm. so that just gives you it gives you like more virtual copies of all of your cards once you get the five mana. Right. And then Niv is just like, hey, I drew all the cards. Oh, this is cute. They're they're running uh, Nahiri. Are all of the lists running Nahiri or is it just that one? I don't know. I mean, that lets you know be they, your Niv. It looks like they all are. Well, it, it's sneaky though, right? Because it lets you go get your Niv and then it lets you cast your Niv again. Yeah, it puts it back in your hand. Yeah. yeah, it looks like they're all running Nahiri. That's cool. Yeah. Maybe that's the Planeswalker for the Pioneer deck and not, uh, uh, what's her name? Nissa. Yeah, probably. Probably. Yeah, yeah they're and, all playing Nahiri. And it lets that's you get sweet. rid of random problem stuff. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. Yep. So i would call this next deck i think it kind of falls somewhere in the mid-range category but yeah it's it's weird when your casting costs are all like one yeah this is kind of what i was alluding to with like disruptive aggro like i would call the death shadow decks disruptive aggro decks yeah you're looking to like not really stop your opponents just kind of like throw a wrench into their game plan and then put a whole bunch of pressure on and hope that they can't recover. Yeah, so you're you're relying on like Inquisitions and Thought Seas and Lightning Bolts and Fatal Push to be that early interaction, right? You have hand disruption for like control and like combo decks. You have creature removal for you know the creature decks. And then you're mm-hmm. hoping to like stick like a big death shadow or like a hex drinker and then let it get big. Yeah. Uh, or a Scourge of the Skyclaves. Yep. Uh, so, like, you have cheap threats, plus you have some disruption. And then this is our first companion deck with our boy Loris. Well, the Niv decks ran... Uh, oh, Gigantha. Yorian. Yorian. Yorian? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, was, I was playing Every that one game. of those lists were 80-card lists. Okay, I was playing... That's what I was playing in Historic. I was Yorianing it up. So I can't, I yeah. can't, uh, can't fault them. But you have Loris, so you have some like cute Loris stuff in the deck as well. You have like Mishra's Bobbles. You have mm-hmm. one Seal of Fire. Ooh, spicy. Yeah. That's, that's an, old school pack. Yeah, it's an it's an enchantment that you can sacrifice to deal to. Yeah. So you can loop it with Loris. Plus mm-hmm. it's an enchantment to pump up your Tarmogoyf. Feeds the Goyf. So it's just a way to get your time away for a little bit bigger. Yep. Um. Yeah. So. Okay. I was just scrolling through the list. Uh, yeah. Ten the pests. Oh really? Two of them. Huh. I, I guess if you play your death shadow and they're like path, you're just like, ha I will make I, six pests. I guess. Yeah, and then I will sadly gain life and not be able to cast yeah, my next death shadow hey i don't know, I don't know. if i agree with that maybe I mean, someone it seems pretty stock it. though no yeah. this this list is running it too oh man yeah it must just be to like feed your scourges and your tarmogoyce when they go to like remove them yeah maybe weird 
when I say like mid range deck, this is as mm -hmm. close to like a classic like I have creatures, I have yeah. removal, and mm -hmm. I have some sort of like interaction as opposed to just like being all in on like all my quote unquote removal is pointed at your face. Right. Like this is actually like I want to kill creatures on the board. Mm -hmm. I want to like and disrupt your hand. If you don't know, that's fine. I, I don't know the answer, so I'm gonna ask. Like, why are the current shadow lists Jund instead of Grixis? Wasn't Grixis like the de facto shadow deck? It was. I don't know. Um, I don't know what caused the switch. Like the only green, like, unless it's really for Hex Drinker. Because, like, we had Goyf for the longest time, and we weren't, yeah. they weren't playing Goyf. They were playing, um, like, Gurmag Angler. Yeah, Zombie Oh, fish. that's probably why. So, if you have Loris, you don't want to exile your graveyard. Oh, I gotcha. And so you don't have... Well, if you have Loris, you can't play Zombie Fish. That's also true. Yeah. So you can't play Zombie Fish... Yep. And then that was your easy way to like turn on Stubborn Denial early to yeah. have that creature that guaranteed four, uh, four, uh, power or yep. more. Yep, so yep, yep. you get rid of Zombie Fish that makes Stubborn yep. Denial worse. Yeah. So, and you also get access to Veil of Summer out of the sideboard, which yeah. I, that's, that's a pretty big game. All and right. And like Assassin's Trophy. So that yep. makes sense. And 10 We the figured pests. it out. You can't not have access to 10 the pests. Sure. Yeah, you gotta have that ten the pests. Gotta have that ten the pests. But like this deck had been Grixis for a while, and I think you could also see like if there are some like you know more big like undercosted black threats that mm -hmm. like worked with Loris, you could see it going back to uh, Grixis. Yeah. At some point. Oh man. Um. I guess you don't get there. But the new domain guy. Oh, the, yeah. The two mana like star star. Yeah. Right. Like with like a little bit of work, you can make it a four four to turn on your stubborn denials. Mm hmm. But I mean, with not much work at all. Yeah. So, yeah, like, you know, one. I mean, you're trying to shock all your lands into play anyway for the dust shadows. Yeah. So like one or two uh shock lands like when you have that card in your hand yeah it's just fine yeah so that could also find its way in, in here mm -hmm. um and then our last deck i can't is ponza <laughs> i can't it, it I can't. was on the list man i'm sorry i believe you i believe you like was that the is that what they have is gruel mid-range no, uh, he's yeah, actually like a mid rangey deck. So Ponza, I forget where the name comes from, but it's just well, land destruction. I mean, th this Gruel mid rangey deck is running three pillages in the main board. Like that's, you don't have to be all in land destruction to be Ponza. This is yeah. a three pillage or Blood Moon deck. That's Ponza. When I think Ponza, I'm thinking like turn two stone rains and pillages and stuff. No, oh. like not. Uh, I mean, the world has changed, so I guess we have seasoned pyromancers and stuff, and Clothes yeah. Clothy has, like, puts in work, I will say. So basically, yeah. Ponza is, like, a red-green, we'll call it mid-rangey ramp deck that's focused yes. on playing, like, under-costed creatures and mm -hmm. playing bigger creatures than you normally play in Modern. And it right. wants to do this off the back of an interaction we talked about before, Utopia Sprawl Arbor Elf. Yeah, so Utopia Sprawl makes an extra mana. It's an enchant forest, and it makes an extra mana. And then Arbor Elf untaps forests. So yes. like Brian said earlier, if you Utopia, or if you Arbor Elf turn one and then turn two, play a land, Utopia Sprawl your other land, you can tap it for two mana, Arbor Elf untap it, tap it again for two more mana. And, you know, play something like a Chandra Torch of the Fine Sun 2. Or yep. what this deck really wants to do is Blood Moon mm -hmm. or Pillage. Like, just yep. blow up your opponent's land. And yep. depending on how all-in you are, and it might have just changed because they've gotten better threats like Elder Gargaroth and whatnot. Well, it used to, it I, used to be that you'd play stuff like, oh gosh, Primal Command. 
We were like, put your land on top of your deck. I'll go search for a finisher. Yeah, so I think that's the Ponza lists that you're thinking of are like the old Primal Command lists. And the reason these lists look kind of weird to you is they don't have to play Stone Rain anymore because Pillage entered the format with Modern Horizons 1. Yeah. I mean, so, like, that's why you're not seeing Stone Rain and, like, those, the old, old lists were the Primal Command lists. Yeah, we're, like, I think they probably just have better threats now. Yeah. And part of me just wants someone to, like, play Plow Under. <laughs> Cards Modern Legal. It is. Cards Nuts. For those of you who don't know, it's three green green. Put two lands on top of their owner's library. Woo. It's basically Talk about three, a time walk. <laughs> it's five mana win the game. Yeah. It's like what what do I what do I do? I'm just gonna draw a land land for the next two turns. Indeed you are. And you <laughs> Thank cast you, this, eighth edition. Yeah. And I, I did this you did this to me on turn three? I did. I did. Oh no. <laughs> um yeah, but it also like, you know, you have Clothis to like act as like graveyard hate slash, you know, just be a clock. Yeah, I mean it's also ramp and modern. Everybody always has lands in their graveyard. Yeah. So it just does a little bit of everything. And then it's yep. just like what are the what are the uh best mythics that they've printed in standard recently? And it's like Elder Gargaroth and Questy B? Sure. Yep. I saw a list with um Glorybringer. This one has one Glorybringer in it. Like it yeah. used to be that Glorybringer was their like finisher. Yeah. But like Elder Gargaroth and Questing B are pretty good. Yep. So I don't know. This is kind of a mid range deck, but like Ponza always has more of almost like a prison element to it. Yeah, kinda sorta. Right? It, where like, where it's it just disrupts. locking you out of the game sometimes. Or it's at least yeah. disruptive in a on a different axis than what you yeah. normally get. Yep. So who this one's running uh Karn the Great Creator liquid metal coating. Woohoo. Yeah. Um so we've kind of maybe sorta said there might be like two kind of mid rangey decks. Kinda uh, sorta in the format. So what are we missing? We're missing the classic Jund mid range deck. Yeah, the actual mid range deck. Yeah. So as I think I said this on a pre-show and I said it on today's pre-show, like the fact that every card in the format basically says like draw a card or get yeah. some sort of like value when you play me playing a deck that wants to one for one you every turn. Yeah. You're in does, for a bad time. Yeah. And like the classic Jund, like, you know, kind of school of thought was the cards I'm going to draw are going to be better than the cards right. you're going to draw later in the game. And the cards in the format have gotten way better. Way and better. Jund hasn't seen like the same increase in card quality. Right. So it's losing that like, oh, my turn five top deck is going to always be better than your turn five top deck. And it's like, no, it's not. <laughs> not even close. No. I would like to introduce you to Omnath. Yeah. Here's my Omnath. Is this better than what you drew? Uh, checks notes. It is. It is way better. <laughs> uh, bummer. Or for the you know for a while. Here's Uro. Can't ever beat that. Yeah. It's been fun. Right. Yeah. Um, Pack it up, boys. Yeah. So, right. It's just lost its its card quality advantage, and yeah. I feel like in these Modern Horizon sets, or like this one as well, they're trying to address that, but the problem is when you increase the power level of a card that can go into Jund, it just mm-hmm. goes into another deck. Yeah, that's and kind of like, the problem I've had a lot lately. It's like, oh, this is a good card for Jund. It's like, no, it's a good card. I'm going to play it in any deck that has a forest in it. Oh, right. crap. We just enabled like three <laughs> other forest decks that aren't Jund. Yeah. Because we've made forests do everything. Mm-hmm. Forest be storming now, boys. Uh, <laughs> Right. Uh, we have Infect is MIA. Yeah, like not anywhere on either list, which um, is weird because like they got some toys not that long ago. Hey, Infect is on is on the goldfish list at 
Uh, oh, is that more than two? That is not more than two, but it's on the list. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, no, it's not more than two. But I think Infect's big problem is, like, this is a lava dart format. Yeah. How do you play infinite X1s when your opponent plays four lava darts? Um, You don't. You don't. You're like, lava dart, and they're like, uh, I'll protect it. Cool. My turn. I will play my creature, sack my mountain. Lava dart, your nerd. <laughs> <sighs> I guess I'm tapped out now, so I guess I have to eat this lava dart and lose my guy. Okay, I only have 12 things that can kill you. Please stop. Yeah. Yeah, so like, if Infect always had a bad matchup with Burn, mm-hmm. and if, you know, you know, if you take... Blitz. All of the aggro decks are just kind of like riffs on burn. Yeah, so. or like, how do I want to play my burn? It's blitz, burn, and like, Jun Death Shadow is four bolts, four fatal push, mm-hmm. and thought seizes and inquisitions. Like, oh, right. I'm on the draw. Please don't thought seize my one infant. Oh, no. No. <laughs> right. So there's just so many things that are just like super hospital infect. Like, yeah. Infect is a deck that will always be around, but mm-hmm. it's best when, like, Tron is 8% of the metagame. Oh, yeah. Tron doesn't interact with Infect very well. Yeah, so, like, decks like Tron, or even to some degree, like, Amulet Titan, right? Like, where mm-hmm. they're, you know, where they're on their first two or three turns, like, not affecting the board real well. Right. Right? And you're like, cool, I can get my blighted agent through and deal you a bunch of infect damage but it's a problem when you know it's all lightning bolts and lava darts i just want to look oh so this amulet titan list it only has one but you know what card infect really has a hard time beating what's that or boreal grazer (laughs) how do you feel when you're when you're like glistener elf and they're like, or Boreal Grazer put it in extra land. And you're just like, oh my god. <laughs> An oath Or Boreal Grazer also blocks uh, Ink Moth. Ink Moth. Yeah, yeah, it's just a nightmare. <laughs> it's like the worst possible day. <laughs> um, Affinity is 100% gone. Yeah. Well, like, so old Affinity is gone. What do you think about all the new modular stuff? Do you think there's might be a new affinity deck? I mean, there it's basically just stuff for hardened scales. Yeah. Right? Like it's are these cards good enough to go into hardened scales? Yeah. And they might, right? Like you're just changing what the deck is about. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reason that like the affinity that was in the format for like the be- since the beginning of modern, there's Yeah, been basically. S- uh, has gone is because they banned Mox Opal, Opal for the sins of uh, Urza. Yep. Right? And so that what just dick. slowed the format down. And I mean, you could look at the last modern pan as them saying, we know it's coming in Modern Horizons 2 and we've got to get yeah. all the fast mana out of the format. No, well, maybe. Because they just ripped all the fast mana out. And they were like, no yeah. more fast mana. But by doing that, they got rid of two decks. They got rid of Affinity that has been yep. around forever. And they forever. got rid of Ad Nauseam Tendrils, which has also been around um, for... Uh, not not, not sorry, sorry, just uh, Ad Nauseam. Yeah, sorry, just Ad yeah. Nauseam. Ad Nauseam Tendrils is the legacy deck. Yeah. Which was also around forever. Right. So by getting rid of Simeon Spirit Guide, like the way you won the game with Ad Nauseam was usually Lightning Storm. Mm-hmm. You draw or, your deck and then make a bunch of mana with Mana Monkeys and cast a Lightning Storm. Yeah. Or I think the newer way to do it was you won with Thassa's Oracle. Oh, yeah, that does it too. Right, you're just like, draw my whole deck. I can't die because of Angel's Grace. And now I'm going yep. to, like, cast a Mana Morphos and make blue, blue. But I need two Mana Monkeys to do this. Yep. And then cast my Thassa's Oracle. And I have three of the Pact of Negations in my hand. Or, yeah, Pact of Negation in my hand. So uh, good luck countering my thing, nerd. So, if you're trying to Oracle, yes, I wonder if Adnaz can still exist with that new Cell Ring. If you were on Cell Ring and Lotus Bloom instead of just Lotus Blooms, 
no, I thought about that. Like you, you would play both and hope to like, you know, have them come off suspend yeah. around the same time and get just a ton of mana. Yeah. Right. You're just trying to get way more mana now. Mm-hmm. So that could work where you're just like, all right, like I well, just need, no, I need you, to... you need less mana. No, you need more. You need to, it used to be to win. You needed six mana, right? You needed one for angels grace. Yeah. And then five for ad nauseum, or you just needed well, five. For and then ad you needed nauseum. three for lightning storm. But then th- th- you drew that out of your deck, right? Oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, drew yeah, that out of yeah. your deck. Right. Now, you can't draw any mana out of your deck. Right. So now you have to have, like, eight mana or seven mana. Yeah. Right? Hmm. So if you can get your mana in such a way that your mana is, like, blue-blue leftover or red-green because you're going to hit a mana morphos, or, like, even, like, a pentad prism, you just need two mana of any color. Yeah. To get yourself back into blue blue. Uh red green would be best, but you just need to get back into red blue or blue blue mm-hmm. would be fine. But like I think it just makes it way harder being up two mana. And maybe the like weird suspend soul ring. Yeah. Soul talisman, perhaps that gets you there because it just gives you two more mana, but it's not colored. So you've got to figure out how to get how to make it colored how to get it to colored mana or have yeah. enough colored mana on the board that you just use this that two colored mana to cast your ad nauseum well your lotus Blo- well, i guess your lotus bloom you know, yeah you can you're... make blue with lotus bloom you can make blue with lotus bloom you can get there but i think it's just harder you need more to line up yeah right Where i wonder if can... anybody's messed around with a like as we were just talking about this and like trying to figure out ways to cheat things. I wonder if anybody's messed around with a fires ad nauseum deck. Huh. Like if you, if you had Phyrexian unlife out. Yeah. Then you're just like, okay, fires. Ad nauseum, draw your deck. And then have one spell left over. I think the problem there is, is like, you can't cast, um, what's it called? You can't protect your combo then. Right. You can't like, yeah, that's true. You can't be like, hey, I need to like cast a force of negation. It's like, nope, 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 nope. Yeah. Not force of negation, pact of negation. Um, okay. So this is where modern currently is. We're missing mid range decks because mm-hmm. what has happened with mid range decks, I think, in all formats, is the cards at five, six, and seven mana pay you off so big now. Yeah, it's worth getting there. Yeah, and it's so easy to get there, especially like in yeah. formats like Modern, Historic, and Pioneer. It's just easy to get to six, seven mana, mm-hmm. right? So now everyone's really focused on like getting to those bigger spells. And so like it's left the spells that are like two, three, and four mana kind of in the dust unless they are very much just like dead you. Right. So we've kind of hollowed Which is exactly out. what we're seeing. Yeah, we've hollowed out where the mid-range decks are because it's dead you decks and decks that just go bigger than the mid-range decks. Yep. Even if they go bigger by like one or two mana, that's big enough to like put them super far behind. Yep. All right. So with all of this said, what does this kind of mean for Modern Horizons 2? What should we be looking for? That's a great question. Thank you. (laughs) but <laughs> I've been kind of working on this episode since we recorded the last episode. And if you notice from the time we recorded our last episode to the time you guys heard our last episode, a whole lot of our predictions came true, which means this format is going to be like completely new, at least for a couple of weeks when people are trying new stuff out. Uh, I think it's important that while we're, you know, brewing with Modern Horizons stuff, or, you know, if you're not a player that's accustomed to playing Modern while you're looking for a deck to get into the format with, it's important to know what already exists because you kind of have to have a game plan for that stuff. That's kind of why we wanted to do this episode, um, so that if you're trying to dip your toes in, you kind of know what's around out there 
and when some when you get hit with your first turn three Karn, you know what to expect, or at least know that it's coming. Or when I don't know you're you get run over by uh, blitz. Like at least you kind of have an idea what the deck's doing, and hopefully in your sideboard you have a plan for it. Um, I don't think at this point it's really worth drawing any conclusions because the entire format is going to be brand new. Kind of like we saw when the first Modern Horizons came out. Like I don't think anybody was really expecting the format to change in the ways that it did. Yeah, um, I think we all so thought that. So... Like, I was say I think we all thought that decks were going to get better. Or maybe yeah. change, but I don't think we just saw like kind of wholesale decks just going away. Yeah, like I remember doing our Modern Horizons one set review episode, and kind of the recur- recurring theme was, "Oh, this might be good if the format slows down, and this might be good if the format slows down, and Renin Six might be good if the format slows down." Well, the the format slowed down. <laughs> And like all of these cards were good and they yeah. mattered and like new archetypes came and like the the whole format just kind of changed within the matter of a couple weeks. So I guess something is, did Modern Horizons 2 slow the format down or did 2019 slow the format down? Um, you know what I mean? Like, did, yeah, did, like, I mean, it could very well be both because actually yeah. Modern Horizons came out and then right afterwards Core 19 did. And Core 19 had... That was a Veil of Summer set, right? It was Core 19? I think so. Yeah. But yeah, like, how much of it was, you know, a combination of we have all these good cards, mm-hmm. and then we've printed all of these cards that are going to... For- core, core 20 came, is core where 20, Veil of Summer yeah. was. Yeah. But, like, you know, Veil of Summer, uh, Field of the Dead in the same set yeah. and then didn't that, that went right into throne of Eldraine. Mm-hmm. Right. And that went into Oko. Yep. And so. And like, that slowed the format down. Yeah. So like, I don't know how much it was modern horizons or how much yeah. of it was just the, the, the increase. Fire in, design. Yeah. The increase in power at mm-hmm. like, let's say three, four, five and six mana. Yeah. Right? So it made it so people could justify playing a four mana spell in modern. It used to be that it was like if you tap out for a four mana spell, if it doesn't say win the game, you are dead, my friend. Right. And now it's like, oh, of course you play a four mana. Of course, of course you play an Elder Gargaroth. I'm going to cast an Omnath. Yeah, I'll cast an Omnath and I'll like. I'll cast my Omnath on turn four and have a fetch land up and then gain four life and get my mana back. Yeah. Right. And that's just not a place we were Mm -hmm. uh, before. Like you, like Jace was good, but Jace could only go in control decks because they were the only decks could that wanted to like be doing something on turn five. Right. And, and I don't know how much also like, like pact of, uh, sorry, uh, force of negation slowed the format down. Probably. Right, where you knew your opponent couldn't just, like, combo kill run you over. Mm-hmm. So it was like, oh, it's okay. I know I'll be okay next turn. Yeah, because and, I, like, I with have stripping this. all the fast mana out, that certainly is slowing the format down again. Yeah. So, but, yeah, I think that you've, when the format is slower and the cards are better you are going to get to play longer games. And I think that's going to let some of the cards that might read, maybe this is powerful, but it's five mana. Right. And it's like, well, maybe I have to reevaluate those cards that are five mana that look powerful Mm -hmm. because it's a format where you're allowed to cast five mana things. Yeah. I mean, it's hard when like you've learned a format and then like the format is no longer what you learned. Yes, and like I, d- I don't necessarily stuff. mean like just the meta because metas metas change. That's part of like playing magic is the meta changes, but like truths that you learned when you learned the format, like modern's a turn three format. And like you said, you know, you can't play four drops cause you'll just be dead. Like yeah. those things are really hard to unlearn. Yeah. 
And like, I think that the, the gameplay in modern, just from what we've gone over has like, uh, significantly changed, right? Yeah. It is, it is like slower things and more value oriented, but there is mm-hmm. like the burn and blitz decks that you have to like prepare for. But if right. you can like weather that initial storm, you can just, uh, you know, accrue huge advantage by casting your bigger spells. Yep. Right. I think the delta between like a two mana spell and a five mana spell is way bigger than it has been before. Yeah. Right. Sure. Like it used to be that like, okay, two mana, five mana spells are better than like two mana spells. Yeah. But it wasn't like a huge gulf, but it feels like, at five mana, you're getting seven mana worth of stuff a lot of times. Yeah, a lot of times. And at two mana, like, I think as a result, a lot of our two mana spells are three or four mana's worth of spells now. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to, like, close that gap by, yeah. like, making the cheaper spells better. But I think what that does is, like, just speeds. It's speeding the format up on one end, and the response is to just go a little bit bigger. Yeah. on the other end, and you're not getting that You're middle. making the gap bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. Another deck that was missing that I just thought of that made me sad is Humans. Remember how good Humans yeah. was? Yeah. Like, Humans was great. Humans yeah, is the only modern deck I have that together. Anywhere. Yeah, like, I'm not saying that it... I'm just saying, like, that deck was unbelievable, and it was like, it's always going to get better because mm. they're always just going to print random Humans, and... Yeah. Uh yeah no deck yeah, no deck is just not a deck anymore does not exist wow. and it's like oh sad times yeah mm-hmm. like it is not like you sc- oh here it is humans point seven percent oof you know what it's right after elves at point seven percent <laughs> you know how does that in- make you feel you know what it's in front of what's that five color elementals. At 0.6%. Oh. Humans oh. used to be the best deck in the format. <laughs> By far. And now it's... Well, it's you get that, that new human, so maybe, yeah, maybe the, that'll do something. The new human is good, yeah. What yeah. is it? Aether Sworn Soldier Guy? Yeah, the one drop. Yeah. He's 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 a good boy. Yeah. Aether, Aether Sworn Soldier Boy is going to Superman that, uh, that deck. <laughs> I mean, the deck um, needed a, another one drop. It did. It it kind of desperately did. So I yeah. don't know. I'm not. I think the card's good. I think it'll. Ether. I'm mm-hmm. uh, sorry. Esper Sentinel. Okay. Esper Sentinel. I just I just want to run this by people. When I say Esper, what do you think? The shard. You think blue, white, and black. Esper Sentinel. Yeah. Just a white. It's good. Just a white. Just a white. We're fine. <laughs> Thanks. So yeah. So. Like I said last week, like pick through the cards that like really scream commandery stuff, Mm -hmm. which is what you had to do last time. And then look for the archetypes they put in the set and figure out like, hey, are these like archetypes I want to try to play in modern? Like, you know, Enchantress, Reanimator. I feel like there's a just free spell tribal, like, Mm -hmm. you know, suspend cards with no mana cost. Waterfall um, style. Yeah, waterfall style decks. So I feel yeah. like those are there. Uh, but then, like, you know, you I think you can ignore, like, Garth One-Eye. Like, that's not going to be... Probably. That's not going to be a... Uh, a you, you don't want to make copies of Siobhan Dragon that you still have to cast? I do not. That sounds yeah. bad. Yeah. Uh, but just, like, pick through. Like, there are going to be things that, like, make a difference. Yeah. For also... Sure. Um, as we said earlier, do not buy these cards at pre-release. Please. No. Don't. Holy like, moly. I couldn't believe how expensive these cards are. Every mythic is like 50 bucks. There's like a dozen rares that are 50 bucks. Like this makes no sense with the number of packs that are going to be open. Like his, yeah. over the last year and a half, I think more cra- packs have been cracked that have been cracked at like any other point. Yeah. And I can't and imagine people that people weren't allowed to see each other. Yeah, I can't now imagine they are. that Modern Horizons so people are going to be like, you know what? I'm good. I don't want to open any more packs. Yeah. Like, no. People are going to keep opening packs. Yes. So, Prices will come down. Yeah, so um, don't like look at cards and be like, I got to get in for this 50 bucks because I think they're going to come down. 
Yeah. Also, like over the next month or so is probably going to be the best time to buy into modern that has ever existed. There has been like little to no focus on modern for a long time now. So a lot of the old staples have come way down in price and shocklands have reasonably recently just rotated out of standard. Plus they did that secret layer shockland where like the price of that is super cheap. So shocks are cheap right now if you don't already have your shock lands. And this fetch land reprint, I think, is going to drive the price of fetches down. I know right now they're pre-selling for like 60 bucks a piece. I think that's absurd with the amount of this product that's going to be opened. I wouldn't be surprised if these fetches got down like $25, $30, somewhere around there. So between that and, like I said, the focus has been off of Modern for a while, so some of the staples are pretty cheap. Um, like Termoglyphs are 20 or 30 bucks now, which is obscene to think about. And like Brian was saying, there's so much of this product going to be opened that I think you can probably build just about any modern deck you want to for about the price of a standard deck before too much longer. Yeah. So with all of this, I think we have a reasonable sense of where modern is, and I mm-hmm. think we have a show. We sure do. So if you want to tweet at us what you're excited about for Modern Horizons or ask about a modern deck you might be interested in putting together, you can get at us at Casual Tripod on Twitter. Yep. You can also hit us up on Facebook at Casual Tryhard MTG. Or as always, you can drop us an email, show at Casual Tryhard MTG.com. Don't forget about our Discord. There's a link in the description and there's a link on all our social media to hop in our Discord. If there's anything in particular you guys want to hear about next week for a Modern Horizons episode, hop in there and let me know. I would say probably Discord and email are going to be the quickest ways to get at me. You're only going to have a couple days between when this episode goes live and when I write the episode and we record on Monday. So I'll try and post something up in Discord. I'm saying that now, but if I do that, you'll have already seen it. So don't worry about that. Um, but yeah, hit me up on either discord or email. I mean, you can hit us up on Twitter or Facebook or whatever also, but probably email or discard discord. I'm going to see it quicker. If there's any specific cards, archetypes, interactions, any rule stuff that you want clarified, anything having to do with modern horizons, hop on in there and let me know so we can talk about it next week. Uh, we also have our TCG player affiliate link. If you're looking to pre-order anything, or once the set goes live, uh, you're looking to pick up any singles once the prices drop a little bit, tcg.casualtryhardmtg.com. Uh, we get a, a percentage of whatever you buy after following that link. Helps keep our lights on, helps keep us recording and making content you guys want to hear. We also have our Patreon, patreon.com slash casualtryhardmtg. Patrons got to hear lots and lots and lots of us this week. They got almost, actually, probably a longer pre-show than our episode ended up to be. So if you want to hear more of us, check out our Patreon, chip in a couple bucks, and you get access to everything we got. We're not picky. And with that, we'll catch you at FNM. Yeah, we're back to FNM. We'll catch you at FNM. <laughs>